Welcome back. That was a great panel on music jobs. Um, lots of interesting different perspectives and interesting resources and also appreciated the chat and hop in. So I know some of you are watching and hop in. This is the third before we have a break coming up for 10 minutes. Um, if you're watching this live stream on amplifymusic.org and on YouTube, you're missing the hop in chat. We're going to try to have things come over as we go here. I want to do a quick thank you for the two of our silver sponsors. One is uh, actually three of our, we have a new one, the College of Arts and Media at CU Denver. Thank you for your new support to the program. We also have Label Logic and the Art of Mass Gathering, Majestic Collaborations and Performing Arts Readiness, who we heard already um, actually a couple of times in the conference. But let me introduce this wonderful panel. This is session 26, Rethinking Music Tourism. David, would you take it away? Sure, hi Gigi, hi everyone, uh, I'm David Hazen. Welcome to Rethinking Music Tourism. Uh, thanks to your great staff, Gigi. This session is going to focus on the role that a city's venues, music scene, and hosted festivals play in driving tourism dollars to their economies and what governments could and should be doing in support of that. Uh, whatever bumps, curves, and delays lie ahead, we're clearly heading towards a post-COVID environment with everybody wondering what that's going to look like how things will be the same as they were, how things might be different. So to start, I'd like for each panelist to introduce themselves, tell us about the work they're doing in the music tourism space, uh, starting with you, Jocelyn. Hi there, I'm Jocelyn Kane. Uh, right now I wear tons of hats, but the most relevant one is um, a senior policy analyst with Responsible Hospitality Institute. Um, I spent 30 years in San Francisco. Uh, I left in 2017 and the last half of that, I was the executive director of the Entertainment Commission in San Francisco, uh, a government body that was in charge of uh, all things entertainment, permitting, licensing, regulation, enforcement around entertainment for the city of San Francisco. Um, and my uh, current pivot is into cannabis, but we'll talk about that if we have the time. All right, Sadia. Hi, my name is Sadia. I'm the coordinator at Music uh, Cities Community. The community is the first ever platform for professionals in all industries using music to create value in towns, cities, and places. Um, we currently have over a thousand members from around the world who can access a variety of content through our platform, such as uh, live virtual presentations and panels, um, Music Cities news, and more content. And the community is part of Music Cities events, where we organize world-leading conferences on the topic of music cities. And we also produce the International Awards Ceremony. We've organized around 29 conferences in over six continents. Um, and we are part of the Sound Diplomacy Group, creating and delivering strategies and increasing the value of music ecosystems. Great, thanks a lot. So I've been tracking the music cities, music tourism space uh, for a while, since it was kind of birthed at, at Canadian Music Week with Shane Shapiro's original Sound Diplomacy presentations and Music Canada's uh, presentations. And then a few years later, uh, I, I had uh, a bunch of clients at the same time in the festival space, including Fest Ticket, Fest 300, and Ottawa Blues Fest. And I remember seeing an ad in the New Yorker magazine on the inside back cover, very expensive, showed a family in front of the parliament buildings. And it, it was just so generic. And I couldn't help thinking that if that same amount of money uh, was invested in, in letting Americans know that they could see in a beautiful downtown waterfront location, uh, Lady Gaga and Snoop Dogg and The Killers and dozens of other acts for like a tenth of the price of Coachella, no disrespect, Jocelyn, but how much more effective and impactful that could have been. So that kind of leads to the first question that I'll direct to you, Jocelyn, is that given that music experiences and events can be a key driver in helping people decide where it is that they want to vacation, what are some of the ways that governments can help promoters, venues, and the live music community, not from a cultural grant perspective, but because it's good for bottom line business and local tax revenues? Uh, well, there's a lot of things. I think the big uh, answer, frankly, is to, for governments to get out of the way. 
Uh, I say this a lot, uh, government, I mean, uh, nightlife and music scenes and, and uh, cultural life is, is in cities organically and it's there in spite of government, not because of government. So we wanted to flip the script and in San Francisco, like I said, we had an entertainment commission and that was part regulatory and part advocacy around uh, more of what you're talking about, bringing more music to more people and more places. There's generally uh, a notion from the government side that music and noise is a nuisance. And I don't call it noise. I call it sound. When someone says, where's your noise ordinance? I call it sound ordinance. I encourage everyone to do the same thing. Some one person's noise is another person's lovely sound. So uh, I think that the most important thing is get out of the way, right? Beyond that, we can get to a space where it's easy to permit uh, entertainment, right? It's uh, we can talk about really like basic where can entertainment happen and ask cities to make more of those spaces available, whether it's permanently through zoning changes or through temporary, right? Uh, permitting for more events to happen. Big cities know the value of concerts and festivals because they've counted it. There's economic impact studies on all of the large ones that are redundant that happen every year. So they know what the value is. They don't necessarily look at the value against the nuisance potential in a way that's balanced. So I think the conversations in all the cities need to talk about uh, the economic uh, importance, like you said, bottom line, not just cultural value against, yes, it's potential nuisance. Yes, you might have to make some like calls to like back to people who are complaining. You might have to pick up a little more trash, whatever it is. There'll be a little more traffic. But you have to understand, right, government come from that place of how do I keep it, you know, even? How do I not? Like, no one should complain in my city. It should be happy all the time. If the more activity we bring, the more potential for, like, chaos and then, you know, problems. So does that make I, – I could talk and talk and talk. Yeah. Does that make sense? Are, are you saying that governments maybe spend less than they normally would out of fear of complaints, nuisance and noise. And and I would even flip that question and suggest, is there more that perhaps festivals and venues can do to support the government, to understand that the government might want to help because it brings in more money than the boilerplate CVB beds and heads uh, for, for conventions that don't need the support and they're going to come anyway. So, so maybe there's, there's an opportunity to, to mobilize um, uh, clubs and festivals and venues to support governments to make it easier for governments to help them. I think that that's absolutely the case. I think that um, it's, uh, it's actually heads and beds. But, but besides that, uh, I think the idea that festivals, anyone asking for physical space and uh, sort of time and place uh, to do more activations and music in a city should consider their community outreach strategy. They should come forward and say, I want to meet with the public officials, fire, like public safety, health, before, they shouldn't have an expectation that they walk in and get a permit one day in and out over the counter. That's a process. If, if more festivals and folks who wanted to do this work were aware of what government faces in terms of like hoops to jump through and challenges, uh, I think they would be definitely welcomed. I think the, the money aspect is sort of secondary because government folks, they know the page is coming. Look, it's we're government or bureaucrats. It's not about the money. It's not, we're not the finance people, right? We're the people out on the ground saying, are you too loud? Don't drop your stuff here, right? Is something using, uh, you know, sustainable energy instead of sucking power off the grid, like whatever, like the, the real on the ground issues are what, and, you know, is there more traffic? Are you blocking someone's driveway? Do I have to reroute a bus, right? All of these things matter and the more organized a festival uh producer is or an event producer is to have taken that stuff into consideration and already have an answer for that the better the city's going to react across the board guaranteed but um i understand all that but don't cvbs at least in the larger cities have advertising and marketing budgets and don't ad agencies spend money with tourism accounts to drive tourism uh traffic to their cities and 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 my point was you know how to make 
music a more attractive focal point for those campaigns than the traditional uh, efforts or the generic ads that aren't really going to motivate people to select that city as a destination. Um, uh, sorry, when we had our pre-call, you know, we were talking about how there are the obvious music cities like Nashville and Austin and New Orleans and Memphis and people go there because of the music. But Sound Diplomacy has done some incredible work in helping uh, less known cities connect um, with music, tourism worthy destination uh, uh, aspects of their city. Can you give us an example of, of uh, a, a secondary city that you wouldn't think of as a music city that you've helped uh, convert into a music city? Absolutely. So I think with small towns, they need to focus on being vibrant, interesting places to live in. You know, you need to attract new residents to come in and visit and then you and then other residents from around the town and international residents will follow in their footsteps so take a look at uh, Cleveland and Mississippi for example it's a small town of around 12,000 residents and they have so much music and blues heritage um, they for example they have the Delta Roots initiative so it's a project that aims to showcase American roots music through live and recorded performances so they're supporting the local musicians and then they have built the Grammy Museum, the B.B. King Museum, uh, which is down the road from Clarksdale that has the Morgan Freeman's Blues Club and it's home to the Dockery Farms. So they even have um, just different, you know, heritage sites for people to come and visit. So that's a reason for residents, not only residents from proximity tourists to come in and visit those towns, uh, which is actually boosting the economy in those small towns. And you have so many different examples of that. You know, look at Roskilde in Denmark. It is a small town. It started with a festival. Then the whole city became invested in music. And festival profits now go back to local communities that are reinvested for other projects, such as education projects. Um, you also have the driving trails in Queensland in Australia. So its destinations can look at music to reinvent these types of trails that are perfect, you know, for just attracting new tourists to come in. If I, if I can just jump in, like the perfect example is what you already said, which is Coachella. No one would have known what is Coachella, where is Coachella, what, where is Palm Springs, what is this place? The city of India, which nobody knows, right, that's the name of the actual city that Coachella takes place in, right? No one had Absolutely. ever heard of India, but now, right, Coachella, the word, the name Coachella and where I live is in the Coachella Valley is everyone comes right everybody knows what compelling it's 20 years later so to your point absolutely i definitely agree what has coachella meant to the whole valley area the whole palm springs area on a year-round basis obviously you don't need much of an imagination to think about what it means during coachella but right. on a year round basis what has it brought well, I mean, it certainly brought a lot of focus to the area. Uh, it's uh, it got younger and younger. So when I first started going to Coachella, like twenty whatever years ago, it was it was grown ups, and then now it's basically fifteen year olds. Uh, but be, well, what it does is it just shines a spotlight on our uh, beautiful location. I think uh, it definitely put this place right on the map internationally which is just astounding uh what do they do as a uh company does golden voice do a whole lot after the fact mm, maybe not so much but but the branding uh is really valuable and so people run around all over the place with a sticker on their car that says coachella and uh you know, if you Google Coachella, you'll see Coachella Valley, you'll see all kinds of other things. It can bring you to the greater Palm Springs area. I, I think that's pretty much what, what it did. Definitely. Yeah. I can, yeah, like just to add to that, I think festivals have a way of directing these tourists to other local areas, you know, to go and visit after the festival is done. They don't just come there and stay for the festival or the event and then leave. They stay there for a couple of days and they support the local economy. Right. Well, and like that's why two weekends. So they had Coachella for one mm -hmm. weekend. Now it's two, right? So they do it again, basically. But people stay in between because people go to mm -hmm. weekend one and weekend two. So the hotels and the Airbnbs are, it is packed around here, much to the dismay of some residents. <laughs> exactly. 
So sorry, I, I know um, environmentally and sustainability wise, um, you know, we, we've all heard and read a lot about all the different initiatives that festivals have undertaken, but uh, on a more specific and micro level, can you suggest three things that venues and clubs can do to be more environmentally responsible? Definitely. So we already know about festivals. They're all, they all have, you know, sustainability efforts right now, most of them, and they really should enhance them more and more. You know, you, we see, for example, festivals that are taking place on cruise ships and then everything is just falling into the water and just destroying the, you know, the, the water. It's not sustainable. So do you need to, for example, the easiest way is to just decrease the amount of festivals at sea. But then when you're talking about music venues, I think they need to create resilience plans across economic development, you know, like hire sustainability directors, for example, to take charge or, or collaborate with local green solutions organizations who are a part of that city and kind of develop this system that they can try to enforce and even, you know, communicate that with their audience. So stop using plastic cups, you know, don't give out water bottles where in areas where water is potable. Um, use blue riders, take a look at Oceanic Global, for example, they uh, promoted a blue rider, which is a one pager listing sustainability requests that can be sent alongside an artist's existing hospitality um, uh, rider as well to kind of promote the sustainability. So these are just a few different examples. You can also use renewable energy in those venues as well. Great. More general question for, for both of you. How will music tourism in general change uh, post-COVID? How, is, how are things going to be different? I, I, would, I would just like to answer this generally as well, because if the, the topic's a really broad one, right? And so uh, I think that music tourism is really important. I think that some cities took it very seriously, like Austin, you know, and whether they had a legacy of music or didn't, they created one and made it their signature. So, so that's just a marketing angle, which tends to, you know, it works and then things happen from there. But I would say that based on the full stop, and this is just across the board, on, in terms of entertainment in general and COVID, based on a full stop, we can do anything from here. We're restarting. Let's restart in a, in a thoughtful way. Let's restart in a way that changes the dynamics, changes the conversations. Like you said, if a CVB used to be completely focused on conventions and hotel stays, let's change that conversation so that the tourism aspect of of you know, the music and the vibrancy and the outdoor like entertainment or indoor or whatever in a city is part of that conversation. I think the answer to your earlier question is why don't they do it? I don't think anyone asked. I don't think anyone came in and pitched particularly hard to say, hey, you know, standing in front of the whatever building, that civic building is kind of dull. Why don't you do X, Y, and Z? So I, I think now's the time. I think if people have an opportunity to pitch there, governments and CVBs and, 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 and pitch music tourism uh, to bring people back to these communities. Do it. Do it now. Do it quick. It works. I've seen that work in Canada where uh, the festivals nationally in Canada and then provincially within Quebec only lobbied their governments for tourism dollars. And the only condition in this case was the festivals needed to be nonprofits. In other words, they could not be AEG or Live Nation owned, uh, but even big, massive institutional festivals like the Montreal Jazz Festival or Festival Day in Quebec City, they were set up and registered as nonprofits for for that exact reason. So, um, it, you know, I don't know what the U.S. version of that would be or what would be required, but it, it seems to me that it, it's a win-win. There's a lot of government money being spent on maybe less effective ways that certainly don't benefit music, and it would benefit the government's goals of heads and beds and, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and restaurant and hotel increased business. So, so uh, yeah, I think there is an opportunity there that, that's, that should be acted upon. And I think sound diplomacy should start rounding people up and organizing that. And you can get a nice lobbying division going there. <laughs> There's definitely many different ways that you can think about tourism in a post-pandemic world. You know, I think it's really important to 
you know, for, for, for cities, especially festivals, for example, to direct tourists to local businesses, for example, that's really creating more of a local economy and, and boosting it up, you know. So festivals can create a tour around the city where audiences are guided through local venues and, her for example, heritage sites to experience artists performing in them. And, for example, uh, festival organizers can create cheaper deals with hotels, Airbnbs and other accommodation sites that are located a little farther away from the city centre in order to reduce these tourist clusters inside the main center of the city so that you don't really need to bother the locals. And noise regulation is very important at this moment. So I think um, these are some efforts that really need to be taken. That's great. Um, does that happen to a large extent in Europe, Saria? And uh, have you seen Jocelyn um, uh, efforts like that for like excursions, day trips to, I don't know, Joshua Tree, which is I guess an hour or two away? Uh, from from the festival site, obviously they go to hotels and and do parties and and packages and things like that. But what what Sari is saying seems to make a lot of sense. I haven't seen it, and I'm wondering if if you guys have. I've never seen a government sponsored effort in that regard. What I see is activations by. Uh, companies in terms of sponsorship opportunities. And I think those are just as important, right? Uh, mm -hmm. It doesn't, I mean, great if you can get government money, but frankly, Canada is one of those places where and whenever I ever went out to a conference and people were bitching, oh, the government doesn't give us enough money. And I was always like, we don't get any money as musicians at all. So shut the hell up. But, but besides that, uh, it doesn't matter if a, if somebody uh, can organize a trip to Joshua Tree or organize yoga before the concert or organize, you know, whatever it is that's related to uh, the uh, greater community. It doesn't matter whether it's Heineken or, you know, whatever company wants to underwrite this because it's basically real estate to, to, to advertise mm -hmm. to who, who cares. Like, it doesn't matter. I think it's a little pie in the sky to think government cough up that kind of money frankly but i mean hey again go ask the worst thing you get is no so go ask and if they can't write a check they can bring a lot of value in a lot of different ways even to make the permit process and any of the bureaucratic things a little easier and a little smoother for people that probably don't want to go near that stuff because they rightfully expect to be uh frustrated by one step of the process or another. Uh, sorry, have you seen anything like what you're describing actually going on with festivals uh, partnering with, with governments to add on uh, to the overall uh, visitor experience when the festival is oh. not going? I think that governments really need to promote the music industry boards, you know, the music um, tourism boards, sorry. Uh, I think it's very important for them to promote that. And, you know, if they're not doing that, then festivals and venues are doing that. So for example, at festivals, you could have local businesses have their own stands. And then when people go to these stands, to these, um, you know, you have food stands, beverage stands, clothing supplies, different kinds of products that are being offered there. And I think that's really important to bring back into the local economy. You know, you're having tourists join in from all around the world. And if it's not all around the world, it's by close uh, proximity cities. So they come in and then they'll be redirected to these local businesses after the events. So I think that's really important. You know, you really, especially when you have an international festival come in and create something in your local city, you really need to work with the locals to help support them as well. New Orleans Jazz Fest comes to mind because they don't just have food stands. They have great, you know, furniture and crafts and clothing that mm -hmm. are all mm -hmm. representative of the local culture. And I think 100,000 Europeans come to Jazz Fest. So... Uh, I, I think that's that's the strongest example I can think of over here. I've seen lesser versions of that that were probably inspired um, uh, by Jazz Fest. But Jocelyn, yeah, and, go on. Sorry. That's okay. No, I just wanted to add another point. Like, for example, in Mississippi, you have all of these heritage sites. And actually, this later this year, they'll be hosting the Music Tourism Convention. So that's going to bring a new crowd of people coming in as well. So it's just building on top of everyone that has already been visiting. So Is I think cities need to create these, uh, create these efforts. Is that Music Tourism Convention a sound diplomacy event? 
Yeah, it's a Music Cities event, so it'll be taking place later this year in September. Excellent. So, uh, Jocelyn, when we were connecting on LinkedIn, when we were introduced a couple of weeks ago, I couldn't help but notice an interesting addition to your title with the words cannabis lead. Um, <laughs> and in the services that you provide to Palm Springs, California, <laughs> I was just wondering, where does cannatourism intersect with music tourism and, and what does that look like? What does it smell like? <laughs> <laughs> we know what it smells like. Uh, yeah, so I did a I did a pivot when I when I left uh, San Francisco uh, into some of this cannabis work, um, and so what that looks like really is is in the conversation around cannabis consumption, not so much the supply chain, but the end of the supply chain, where do customers use the products that they've been able to buy legally, you know, in various states. And so in Palm Springs, we were one of the first communities to have lounges, that's what we call them. They're social spaces that allow uh, consumption and uh, they're all over this valley. And so adding music, adding entertainment, adding uh, whatever you want to these consumption spaces is where it's starting. Now there's be there's button breakfasts in Desert Hot Springs. There are many, many hotel hotels dot com. In fact, did a big 420, um, you know, advertising scheme uh, just for that day in terms of you know, putting up hotels that are 420 friendly. So it's becoming a big deal, absolutely. Down here in this part of California, it's very much uh, more normalized. And so people definitely come here for cannabis experiences and there's more to come. And anyone who wants to hear more, hit my LinkedIn, follow me on Clubhouse, follow me on wherever you can, because I would love to meet all of you. Well, that's great. Um, we're going to have to conclude on that high note, no pun intended. want to thank <laughs> everybody uh, for, for joining. That was great. I learned a lot, and uh, I'm sure everyone in the audience did too. So thank you, uh, Jocelyn and Saria, and thanks again to Gigi and the staff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Yeah, he very helpful information and, and a nice closing there, David. Appreciate it. So we are about to hit break time. We're going to take a 10 minute break here at uh, Amplify. And I just want to remind you, you know, that we have the exhibit halls and the people section. There's lots of networking opportunities as well as 1.25 p.m. Pacific time. We'll have our mixer. I hope you'll put a pin in that on your schedule and join us. And thanks again to the, for all of you on this great panel. We really appreciate it. Thank you for having us. Thank you.